Hello and welcome to Military Times Live at Fort Ward Battlefield and Historic Site. It, we are indoors today, it's raining outside, and City of Alexander requires masks, so we'll have these on the entire time. And I'm joined by historian Brian Briones. Brian, welcome to Military Times, and thank you for having us. Sure, good to be here. Uh, welcome to uh, Fort Ward Museum and Historic Site. C can you tell me a little bit about can you tell me a little bit about the um, what, what we're looking at? Do, do you want to look at the the uh, the model of Fort Ward? Sure, we can do that. And for our viewers back home, Fort Ward, we're about four miles away from the Pentagon. So if you're in the military long enough, you, you might end up in this very area and actually drive by Fort Ward all the time. It's really small and it's right next to a grocery store and and the highway. So what we have here is a model of uh, Fort Ward as it looked during the Civil War. Fort Ward was the fifth largest Union fort that surrounded Washington, D.C. out of 164 forts and batteries. Um, it's in the shape of an elongated star here. Um, today, Fort Ward has 90% of the structure remaining um, that has been preserved. Uh, and we do have a reconstructed portion of Fort Ward, the Northwest Bastion here. Um, so that looks like it did during the Civil War. Um, each point on the uh, fort is called a bastion and the way it was designed was to have as many artillery pieces uh, giving covering fire to each other as possible. So the front of the fort is actually out here. So you'd have artillery positions here and here and here and here. Uh, to cover and fire on the enemy uh, from multiple points. Um, if you come to Fort Ward today, um, you can start out at the reconstructed uh, gate uh, of the original fort. It's built uh, using the uh, plans from the original uh, Civil War fortification. You can follow a path that goes past the bomb proofs, which are these structures here. Um, those are essentially bomb shelters um, that could have been used if the fort came under attack and you can follow our little path that goes all the way to the reconstructed portion, uh, the Northwest Bastion that has our reproduction artillery pieces. So you can see our uh, reproduction artillery pieces that were used during the Civil War. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the time frame when this was built and when this was being used? Sure, so construction of Fort Ward began in 1861 um, and it was remodeled in 1863 uh, because a blind spot was found out front so they had to do a major reconstruction of it. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. On the spot, huh? That's right. Um, they brought in laborers, uh, paid laborers, and uh, they also used you know, army personnel uh, to reconstruct it. And they actually uh, kept working on it until uh, the war ended. Well, that's interesting. And once the war ended, did this, did this have any use? Uh, it did not. Uh, after the war ended, the, uh, it was abandoned, and the usable portions were sold at auction. Interesting. Could you show us a little bit of well, th that really interesting map there about where, where it is and how it served in, in the Washington, D.C. area? Sure. So Virginia secedes in May of 1861. So that makes enemy territory all of this area here right across the Potomac River. So a stone's throw from the Capitol and the White House. Uh, Fort Ward is located right here. Um, and Alexandria is here. When we talk about Alexandria during the Civil War, we're talking about Old Town, uh, what we think of as Old Town today. So Fort Ward today is in the west end of Alexandria, and that would have been the farm field uh, during the Civil War. Uh, Fort Ward is located on a high point, and always take the high ground, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we've got the uh, uh, Leesburg and Alexandria Turnpike and the Little River Turnpike here. Those are the two major uh, thoroughfares uh, in the area. So Fort Ward has guns that can cover both of these areas, protecting from the west, because if you go far enough out that way, you've got uh, Manassas. And the first major battle of the Civil War is the Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas. And uh, the uh, Union forces lose that battle. Uh, Fort Ward is kind of a response to that. So we're getting a toehold in enemy territory uh, to be able to defend the capital, which is right across the river from enemy territory. And, and there were several Several forts here, right? Right. There's 164 batteries that go all the way around Washington, D.C. Uh, as the war begins, um, they start off as little roadblocks here on uh, the Heights in Alexandria, or Arlington, I'm sorry, Arlington Heights. And then they start building more and more all the way around Washington and Alexandria. 
And they extend all the way down to Alexandria because Alexandria during the war and, and before is a, a major transportation hub. So we do have these turnpikes that go through Alexandria. But most importantly, you've got the uh, Potomac River and you've got a deep water port here. So uh, the fastest way to send uh, bullets and beans um, during the Civil War is by by sea. So you go, you take the Potomac out to the uh, Chesapeake, out to the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, you go all the way down the coast of the Confederacy. Uh, this is interesting, looking at this Little River Turnpike, that's still the name of the street right down the road here, right? That's correct. These, these uh, still exist. And uh, the Leesburg and Alexandria Turnpike is uh, Route 7 today. So uh, Route 7. Oh, yeah. it's Seminary? Oh, a lot of familiar names there. That's Anybody right. who lives in the Pentagon, so we're about... Uh, so we're, so we're, we're right there, the Pentagon. The Pentagon is right here on the site of uh, Fort Whipple. Do, do these exist also? They do not. Anything in red on this map uh, has been destroyed by uh, time and development. Interesting. So if, if you're ever stationed at the Pentagon or Fort Myers, which is over here, did I say that right? For, uh, the, the base right there is Fort Myers? Right. The you'll probably live somewhere in this area. So th this is right around the corner from a lot of military members. It's current housing who are assigned to one of the bases here or the Pentagon. Interesting. What are some of these items below it? So below we've got some uh, items that would have been uh, used by the heavy artillery men who manned these forts. So the, the point of these forts is to keep the, the enemy from getting into Washington. And the way the Army decides to do that is with heavy artillery. Um, so what we got here is a haversack, and that would have held uh, various implements for uh, working and firing a cannon. Um, you've got shell tongs on this side that would have been used uh, to hold on to some of the artillery shells. So some of them, uh, like the mortar shell over to the left there, uh, they've got ears in them. So these little indentations here. So you would take the tongs and put them in there and uh, lift up, and that's how you would uh, move a piece like that. And Brian, I, this is one of these things I've always wondered, and I've looked it up and never really figured it out, and you're the right guy to ask, and I'm a little embarrassed. Cannonballs have explosives inside of them like a mortar do, and, or, is it, or is it just a big projectile? Correct. Well, there's different types of uh, projectiles that, that were used during the Civil War. So some were solid shot, and that's a solid iron ball. Um, those are meant for destroying structures and shipping and that type of thing. But you've also got exploding shells. So those contain a bursting charge on the inside uh, that would have been uh, ignited by a fuse. So up here in the top, you would have a fuse screwed in there. And this is very similar to, um, if you remember the old Bugs Bunny cartoons and he lobs a bomb that's got a fuse that. on it. It's just like that. So when you fire a cannon, the propellant charge, the propellant explosion lights that fuse on top. And depending on how long that fuse is, uh, it goes down into the, uh, into the shell itself. That will give you how much time uh, the shell will be in the air. And when it gets to the bottom of that bursting charge, it's just enough to burst open the shell uh, so that it splits into pieces and you have the pieces raining down. Uh, oh, so depending on the distance, the artillery, the people at the artillery would, would cut the fuse to, for it to blow up at the right time? Right, so artillerists are, are, are also uh, math magicians. Uh, so they have to be able to calculate without a calculator uh, how how long a fuse has to be, uh, for and how fast it burns to give uh, uh, the time of the air for distance that they want to go for. We've got a couple of examples of uh, fuses over here. Um, so up here at the top, you can see a little red and a little green tube, and those are um, pre-measured tubes. So. Uh, depending on the color, um, it's, it's a known uh, uh, time for burn. So if you put that whole thing, say one is five seconds, say the green one's five seconds, and you only need it to burn for two and a half seconds, you cut that thing in half, and you pop it into the, to the, uh, the shell, and it'll burn for two and a half seconds. Oh, wow. And so uh, what we also have in here are different things, uh, different parts that the artillerists would have used. So we've got uh, different sites here that they would have used. They've got um, calipers, which are essentially uh, sort of a computer uh, to measure shells, to measure um, the uh, actual bore of the cannon. Um, we've got the 100-pound Parrot shell, which is uh, the largest projectile that would have been fired here at Fort Ward. And that would have been fired from the uh, gun you see in the background there in that photograph. So that's a 100-pound Parrot rifle. Uh, that'll lob a shell about five miles. 
Interesting. This is so people can do their, their uh, what is it, mathematics? <laughs> yeah, so that's the Civil War laptop right there. Um, it's a traveling desk, portable writing desk, so it's got a writing surface on it, and it also hold, has a space for an inkwell and uh, dip pens. Oh, wow. And what do we have next? Should we come over this way? Sure, let's go over that way. Is this a cannon? So this is actually a uh, Cohorn mortar. This is a 24-pounder mortar. Uh, it it, it uh, fires a 24-pound shell. Um, the thing itself weighs considerably more than that. Um, but the, uh, the range on this is adjusted by how much powder you put in there. Um, so you put the powder in, and you light the fuse on the back, and uh, off it goes. How, how accurate is it? Because it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of space for it to... <laughs> To guide the, the munition there? Uh, it can actually be pretty accurate. There's some, uh, some teams that, that shoot these for sport uh, still today. And, really? Uh, they, do, they do pretty accurate uh, shooting with those. And back in those, today it's easy to tell what a mortar is. It's a little tube like this versus artillery, which is a huge howitzer. How, how is a mortar different from a cannon in, in the Civil War era? Okay, so uh, a mortar is meant to uh, get at the enemy who is maybe hiding behind a structure or is maybe in a trench. Uh, so a mortar is, is, I like to think of it like uh, shooting a basketball into a hoop. So it goes up and over. Whereas a cannon is more of a uh, straight line of flight. So it's more like throwing a football to hit a target. There we go. And I think mortar, mortarmen and women these days are now, they say, high angle hell. And I, I'm wondering if <laughs> I, from the beginning it must have been that. Right. Interesting. And this is the part that we, we kind of were talking about earlier in the, um, if you saw the title of the video, the, the body armor. Okay, so we've got an example of a Civil War era body armor. Um, it looks like it actually should be out of the Middle Ages. Um, it consists of 12 iron plates. There's six on each side, and they're held together by a keyhole and rivet system. So you've got the little keyholes here, and you pop, pop uh, each piece onto the rivet, and they all fit together. Um, at the bottom, you've got uh, these uh, sort of thigh protectors, upper thigh protectors, and those are held on by hinges and uh, with pins to them. So they're detachable. Uh, this was uh, not a uh, standard issue uh, piece of equipment. Oh, really? What was it? it was, people brought it on their own? Right. It was a private purchase thing. Um, your family could buy that for you if they wanted uh, little Johnny to have a little more protection. <laughs> um, but uh, um, you would actually have uh, sort of a traveling salesmen follow the army. They were called sutlers, and they would sell this type of thing um, to the soldiers who could buy them on their own. Um, it cost uh, between 5 and $8 at the time, which is a pretty considerable sum. That's about a third to a half of uh, a private's uh, monthly pay. Oh, really? What would it protect against? So it was meant, uh, it was marketed as a bulletproof vest, so it's, it's uh, meant to protect against uh, pistol and rifle shot. Uh, it's advertised as being able to stop a pistol bullet at uh, 25 yards and a rifle bullet at 220 yards. Um, however, these uh, these um, claims are, are slightly exaggerated. Um, I like to think of it as more bullet resistant. Uh, we've got a, uh, I've seen um, a Civil War soldier who uh, uh, actually wrote to his mom and said, I took this bulletproof vest out. We weren't too sure if it was, how it was gonna work and how well it was gonna perform. So a bunch of officers got together and we had pistols and rifles. And at 50 yards, a rifle goes through it and takes a huge chunk of it with it. So. Um, he actually said that so much material went through and away from the vest that it would have killed the devil himself. Really? <laughs> so It just makes a projectile even, an even bigger projectile. Right. The pieces flying off of that thing are turned into jagged uh, iron shards that are going into the, the wearer. Um, and you got to remember that during the Civil War, infection and uh, any kind of medical procedure is pretty hazardous in its own self. Also, something, something small could be, could be big. And I think... In modern day medicine, I, th I think what I've heard is that the, the medicine is so good that there's so many people surviving things that, you know, even in World War II and definitely in the Civil War would definitely not have survived. Right. There's, there's many illnesses, and in fact, um, you lose a lot more soldiers during the Civil War to sickness and illness than you do to any kind of enemy fire. Is that right? That's correct. Was this ever successful, or was it... 
Um, it was not very successful. In fact, the, the war starts in 1861, and by 1862, people are not wearing this anymore. Um, if you can imagine, you've got boys coming from Vermont and Connecticut, and they are wearing these things, and they come down and they meet Virginia summer. Um, so it's a little warm and a little humid, and by the time they, they march around for a few miles, they say nuts to this, and they, they take it off, and you find these by the side of the road. <laughs> um, in fact, there was a, a unit that marched by the White House, and they left these in the gutter in front of the White House. <laughs> what are we looking at here in this firearm? All right, so what we've got here is a um, 18, model 1861 uh, Springfield rifled musket. So this is sort of the standard issue firearm uh, for the uh, Union soldier during the Civil War. Uh, it's one of a couple, but this is probably the most uh, prevalent. It fires a 58 caliber uh, minier ball. So that's a big chunk of lead that weighs a little over an ounce. Um, it can be fitted with a bayonet, um, which is a triangular shaped bayonet um, that would have fitted in a, a bayonet scabbard uh, like that. Um, people think of the Civil War and they think of, of uh, soldiers, uh, you know, uh, fencing with bayonets and, and fighting and, and um, getting a lot of uh, action with the bayonet. The bayonet is actually most used as a digging tool and around camp, and uh, they use it for tent stakes <clears throat> to hold, it, hold up their, oh, really? their, their tent um, because they, they don't really use it in battle that much because this uh, rifled musket can reach out and touch somebody at 800 yards. Oh, that, that's quite the range. Right. I did not imagine that. <laughs> well, they're also fighting in, in long lines uh, using uh, what we call linear tactics. So you're fighting literally shoulder to shoulder with, with uh, 100 guys that are out uh, to your side. And so uh, the other side is just lobbing bullets into that formation. That sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it was. And let's move along. What else do we, do we have here? So what we've got on this side is um, an exhibit that kind of goes through uh, life in uh, Washington during the Civil War inside the defenses of Washington that we talked about. Um, in this case here, uh, what we have is kind of a juxtaposition of uh, what your average soldier would have used uh, for meal time. Um, you've got a uh, sort of uh, a pail there that's made out of tin. You've got a tin plate and a uh, tin cup there. So the, the army would have issued you a tin cup and maybe a plate. Um, your, whoever was on uh, mess detail got, got the, uh, the boiler there, the pail, and um, would basically use the army rations, your salt pork, lots of salt pork, or whatever you could forage and put that into a, a, a stew or whatever you could make out of it. Um, and you juxtapose that with uh, some of the civilian stuff. So you've got also, you know, congressmen who lived uh, in Washington during the war, but this is the type of thing that they're eating out of. So that's a, a gilded soup tureen with uh, silver ladle and uh, spoons there that they would have been eating with. What was the sentiment here? So I think kind of in a, in a little bit of a border area between nor north and south, what was the overall? So it, Alexandria is actually occupied by Union forces the day uh, after Virginia secedes from the Union. So um, the, the people, the citizens of Alexandria, their sentiments are more uh, secessionist and uh, they're more in line with the Confederacy than they are with the Union. Oh, really? So th that could cause any conflict for, for, for the troops here, for the Union <laughs> troops here? At the beginning, it did uh, a little bit, uh, but nothing uh, too major that, that got out of hand. Um, there were a lot of Union forces in this town uh, during the time, so um, there wasn't, uh, you know, too much that the that the uh, that the uh, residents could say about that. Interesting. And we have uh, for viewers back home. We're going to go around. We're going to see some some more firearms. Did, did you want to go this way or did you want to go that way? Uh, we can go that way. Okay, sounds good. And for our viewers back home, we are indoors. It's, ra it's raining, so that's why we're wearing a mask. So we're required to wear our masks indoors. Fort Ward does have a battlefield area that's open to the public. So if you're in the area, you can, you can come into the museum and actually check out the actual battlefield itself. Right. And for right now, uh, Fort Ward is open on uh, Fridays from 11 to 4 o'clock and also on Saturdays from 11 to 5 o'clock. 
Uh, so you can come visit the museum at those times. But the uh, historic area outside is actually open from sunup to sundown seven days a week. Oh, I see. We see some projectiles over here. Sure. So <clears throat> that kind of caught my eye there. I didn't see it earlier. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about projectiles, uh, cannon projectiles, and here's some uh, examples. Um, so we've got a, a solid shot over there, as I, I was talking about earlier. That's just a solid piece of uh, iron. Um, we've got uh, some case shot in here, which is fun because uh, that is a hollowed out shell that's filled with musket balls or maybe smaller iron balls. So that way when it bursts, you have multiple projectiles that are raining down. Uh, essentially a shrapnel shell. Um, we've also got some hand grenades here. Um, so a lot of people don't know that, uh, that hand grenades existed during the Civil War. And that's these right here that have the little fins on them. So you've got the exploding charge in the front there and the stabilizing fins and a little plunger at the front. The only problem with these grenades is that for, in order for them to go off, uh, the plunger has to hit the ground and it has to hit the ground at a 90 degree angle or it won't go off. Um, if that happens, the enemy picks it up and tries his luck chucking it back at you. Really? <laughs> oh, that sounds pretty true. I want to get a 90 degree angle and throw it straight up. I don't know. If right. So, um, and the last type that we've got here is a uh, canister shot. So that's these little, uh, it looks like soup cans. And those are filled with uh, projectiles as well. So smaller iron balls. And what that does is that turns your cannon into a giant shotgun. So at close range, uh, 300 yards or less, uh, if you've got canister shot in there, uh, you're gonna tear a hole in uh, one of those formations that we were talking about. Oh, interesting. <clears throat> So here we have uh, some of the uh, collection of Fort Ward's uh, firearms. And we've got a nice little cross-section here of uh, uh, the progression of uh, firearms in the United States uh, just before and during the Civil War. So we start off with the 1842 Harper's Ferry musket. So this is a smoothbore uh, weapon uh, that is muzzle loading. And we go to the 1855 Harpers Ferry rifle musket. So this one was manufactured at Harpers Ferry, which is one of the uh, arsenals uh, for the United States Army. Um, and this is rifled. So this has got the lands and grooves inside of the barrel uh, that uh, increase accuracy and distance. Um, <clears throat> they, they tried out a uh, technological advancement here. So uh, with the 42, uh, you have to load the cartridge in the front and smash it down with a uh, ramrod. And you have to put a percussion cap uh, onto the cone at the back there, pull the hammer back, uh, pull the trigger, and the percussion cap um, makes a little spark and ignites the powder that's on the inside and fires the, uh, the projectile. Um, that's kind of a slow process. You've got a cap box on your side, a cat pouch, and you're pulling that out and you're putting one on each time you want to fire. Um, a well-drilled soldier can fire that three times a minute. So to shave off some time from that, <clears throat> what they came up, was, up with was the uh, Maynard tape primer. And what that is, essentially, it's a strip of caps in a little coil inside of that little door there. And every time you pull the hammer back, it advances one cap at a time. So that way you're not fumbling around trying to get a uh, percussion cap onto the uh, cone there. Uh, the problem with that is when it gets wet, uh, the tape falls apart and it doesn't work well. Oh no. So that is actually deleted on the next model, which is the 1861 Springfield Rifle Musket, which is what we showed on the other side. And that we have another example here. Uh, so you can see that that is actually deleted uh, from that uh, next model. Were these all developed during the war itself? Uh, they were. So, um, you know, uh, when the war starts, or actually this is before 1855, so just before the war starts, and then 1861 when the war gets going, uh, they decide that, that it's better to leave that, that percussion system off. And actually in 1862, uh, 60, 63, they refine it a little bit more and uh, make the ignition system a little more reliable with the, uh, the uh, 60, uh, 63 model of the Springfield. <clears throat> well, that's interesting. And my eye just caught those, those hats back there in the, kind of a really cool hat case. Sure, so we've got a uh, new exhibit that we're uh, installing currently. Um, so we went through our, our collection and we, we found some of the, uh, uh, some interesting headgear that, that we liked. So what we've got here 
We'll start on this side. It's kind of a, uh, it's a private purchase hat that's based off of the kepi that was issued to the soldiers. And this was for an officer. Uh, his wife took it home and did some uh, needlepoint on there. And actually, uh, he was a cavalry officer. So she did a, a nice uh, image of a uh, cavalry soldier um, on a glorious charge. Um, in the middle here, we've got a, uh, a Navy uh, chapeau. And um, I like this one because it's, it's a little bit interesting. So it's made out of, it's got beaver fur on the inside there and gold bullion on the side. Um, uh, the Navy refers to it as a uh, fore and aft hat. And that style of hat existed from all the way from the Civil War to uh, World War II. Really? That type. <clears throat> That's obviously the case for it, right? Yeah, I like. It's kind of interesting because they would they manufactured the, the the case to look just like the hat. So the hat is made to uh, fold up and be put under your shoulder, under your arm. I see. <laughs> uh, and lastly, we've got a Shaco. So uh, the U.S. Army used this type of, of headgear uh, prior to the Civil War. Uh, militias would use it during and uh, before and after the Civil War. Um, the the brass uh, insignia you see on there is actually uh, post-war. Uh, so this piece, this individual piece, it actually has parts from before, during, and after the war that somebody just cobbled together. So that makes it kind of interesting. Interesting. And could, could you show us this rocket launcher? Sure. Real so quick, it sounds pretty. It seems pretty interesting. What we have here is an example of a uh, hail rocket launcher. Uh, the defenses of Washington were a uh, nice and safe spot uh, where the enemy couldn't get at you, so uh, they like to test uh, new and interesting uh, weapons out uh, in the area. So uh, the artillerist took this rocket launcher um, and, and tested it. It, it actually, uh, this particular piece is uh, one of three that we know to exist. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't used widely during the war because it was pretty inaccurate. Uh, basically, you could scare horses with it, but it was an improvement over the previous version of rockets, which were the uh, Congreve rockets. Um, in the national anthem, you hear the rocket's red glare. They're talking about the Congreve rocket, and this is sort of the updated version, the hail rocket. Um, it was a uh, projectile that was uh, stabilized in flight due to uh, a spinning motion, so the vents the ports for the uh, rocket exhaust are at an angle. So you put it in the back, you light it, and when it reaches the uh, right amount of thrust, um, it goes through the tube and starts spinning. And in theory, uh, the spinning, like a football, uh, keeps it uh, more accurate as it goes out, but apparently not accurate enough. Oh, I see. The, how, how much development, weapons development occurred in, in the Civil War? So there, there's quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of stuff uh, that uh, different companies tried out. Um, a lot of it didn't work. Um, repeating firearms uh, start to uh, gain popularity. Uh, but the, uh, the people in charge of the money think that uh, if you're firing a whole bunch of bullets, you're going to be missing a lot. And if, you have, if it takes you 20 seconds to load a musket, then you're going to be more accurate with that shot. Um, and it's going to cost less because you're not firing as many bullets. There we go. <laughs> one shot, one kill, way back when. That's it. Where are we up to next? I think we have time for one or two more stops. Okay, why don't we check out uh, our medical exhibit here. So <clears throat> this is uh, medical care during the Civil War. Um, makes quite a few advancements. Um, when we think about medical care in the Civil War, a lot of us think, you know, the sawbones, um, butcher doctor who's, who's hacking off limbs. Um, you can see that we've got a, a nice big bone saw there. Um, in actuality, um, while that did happen, um, it wasn't just for the sake of, of gore. Um, it was an actual necessary medical procedure. Um, when, a, when a 58 caliber mini ball hits bone, the bone doesn't break, it shatters. And during the Civil War, they don't have a way to effectively fix that. If you leave the bone broken like that, um, the, the blood will get infected, you'll get sepsis, and, you, and the patient will die. So the only way to prevent that is to amputate the, uh, the affected area. So they do that with this uh, capital surgeon's kit. Um, you start off with one of these capital knives, and uh, you cut through the flesh and the muscle, 
uh, you get down to the bone uh, after suturing up the uh, veins and arteries. Uh, you use the bone saw to uh, carefully cut through the bone. Uh, you use a file to file it down nice and smooth. Uh, you sew everything up, you pack it with gauze, and uh, you uh, send the uh, soldier on his way uh, to a hospital, uh, a more effective hospital. Um, and uh, another misconception is that uh, during one of these surgeries, you've got the man screaming, you, you give him a shot of whiskey, uh, there you go. <laughs> or you have him bite on a bullet, um, and that's supposed to uh, you know, help him deal with the pain. In actuality, uh, they had different anesthetics. Um, ether was one that they used, so you'd put it on a sponge, you'd put it over the uh, patient's face, um, he would breathe in the, the air, and it would uh, render him unconscious. Uh, after the surgery, you wake him up as best you can with a Civil War era type CPR, basically. They bend him at the waist to work his diaphragm so that way he can have uh, oxygen going into his lungs. And he gets a little groggy and uh, he wakes up enough. Uh, you want him to be slightly awake because if his, if his wound starts bleeding again, you need him to be able to notify somebody to help him out so he doesn't bleed out. And you got to remember that uh, <clears throat> there are thousands and thousands of these uh, injured men on, on uh, these battlefields after these battles. So um, a good surgeon can get through this type of operation in about 10 minutes. Well, there must have been a lot of advancements in, in, in medicine at that time. Uh, there were. They're, they were still working on, on germ theory. Um, they, they hadn't quite uh, figured out that, uh, that germs uh, caused infection. Um, they hadn't really discovered germs yet. Um, so one of the interesting things that came out of it was the, the Union soldiers or the Union surgeons were, were using thread and they would do an operation and they would take the thread off the spool and stitch people up, cut it, pull the next piece out and uh, stitch up the next guy. Um, you might take the saw and to clean it, you would wipe it on your apron or maybe your boot and go to the next guy. So obviously that, that spreads infection. In the Confederacy, they had to make do with, with less, material, uh, less materials. So one of the things they used to stitch up, uh, to stitch up after an operation uh, was horsehair. Uh, horsehair is uh, coarse, and um, in order to soften it, uh, they would boil it. So when they boiled it, we know now that the germ that we're killing the germs that are on that piece of thread. They're also not as long as a spool of thread, so you would use a couple and then you'd go on to another one, and it would never touch uh, two people. Um, and as it shook out, uh, these Confederate after these Confederate sur surgeries, fewer people were dying from infection, and that was because they were boiling it um, beforehand. And that that's how they figured that. Out. I would have imagined that they knew that way before, because uh, I think vaccinations had been around for at least 100 years ish right they, uh, vaccinations have been around for a while but um actual germ theory uh, I, I think was was not really they didn't know how how infection spread through through that type of of, uh, of medium oh that's unexpected uh, that's not something i expected to to understand i think we, we we have one more stop here with the 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 uniforms So this is an exhibit we like to call Fighting in Style. So over here on the first uh, case, we've got the uh, uniform of a Zouave. A Zouave is a special type of uh, Civil War soldier. Uh, it's modeled after the uh, French uniforms of the uh, Zouaves. Um, and the French got that from a uh, North African tribesmen, tri tribesmen called the Zouawa. Um, and they had this distinctive kind of vest with the uh, little uh, markings on it uh, and uh, also the uh, fez that's there. Um, they would have had some baggy pants, as you can see in the photograph there. Um, the baggy pants helped out with movement. Um, and these guys, um, uh, during and before the war, were kind of known for acrobatic uh, movements. Um, sort of like, uh, before the war, they're kind of the silent drill platoon of uh, their day where they go around doing military demonstrations but also mixed with some acrobatics so human ladders and that kind of thing um, and they just look cool uh, for people at the time so yeah. uh, quite a few uh, units of zouaves were, were formed um, later in the war they figure that you know we don't really need the baggy pants so they go to regular pants and sort of more standard uniforms uh, even deleting the fez in the middle here we have a uh, 
what appears to be a standard issue shell jacket from the Civil War. But if we look a little bit closer, we see that this one's actually manufactured from denim instead of the usual wool. Um, so near as we can tell uh, from what we've uh, heard about this piece is that it actually was used by someone who served uh, working for the Army. Uh, they wanted it to look sort of military, uh, but they probably worked in a warmer climate, so they needed something that breathed a little bit better. Uh, so they copied the pattern, but used a different material so that it would be a little bit cooler. And lastly, we've got a Veteran Reserve Corps jacket. So during the Civil War, um, if you were injured um, and you were sort of a wounded warrior, you'd, you'd be sent home uh, if it was bad enough. Um, if you wanted to uh, rejoin, um, they decided well, during the war, around 62-63, uh, they decided that they needed more manpower. Um, and one way to do that was to get some of these uh, wounded warriors um, and have them uh, rejoin the ranks. But they weren't well enough to be able to put into frontline service. So <clears throat> they formed the Veteran Reserve Corps and gave them a distinctive uniform, which was actually the inverse colors of the, act the regular uh, army uniform. So you've got the light. Uh, the light blue with the dark blue trim, uh, which would have been reversed. Uh, so the Veteran Reserve Corps did things uh, that were sort of more behind the lines, like inside the defenses of Washington, they served as, as uh, sometimes garrison, but uh, also as provosts um, and uh, hospital stewards and that type of thing to sort of free up able-bodied men to go fight at the front lines. So I expected, you know, advancements in munitions, advancements in medicine, but I, I, this isn't expected to be advancements in fashion during, during the Civil War. <laughs> yes. So, and there it is. This is the Fort Ward Museum and Historic Site in Alexandria, Virginia, just a couple miles from the Pentagon of Fort Myers. The, Brian, if somebody wants to visit here, can you tell us once again how, how they can do so? Sure, so um, we are open on Fridays from 11 to 4 and on Saturdays from 11 to 5. Um, we are located inside of a uh, park uh, from the city of Alexandria. Um, so the park itself is actually open uh, from dawn to dusk and that includes the historic area that is outside, uh, the historic portion which is uh, the remains of our fort and the reconstructed portion. And if someone missed the, the earlier part here, and we'll, we'll, we'll end right here so you can see what the fort looks like. You can see this, and I, one remarkable stat that I heard is most of it is still intact. So if you, it, the way it looks here is essentially how it looks out there, and the way it looked way back when, right? Right, so this is what it looked like during the Civil War. Uh, today you'll find that the walls are much lower due to erosion after 160 years. Um, there's trees growing in and out of it, so it's kind of returning back to the earth, um, except for the reconstructed portion, which we have fixed uh, and reconstructed to look like it did during the Civil War. Well, Brian, thank you so much. We're absolutely ex excited to be here and to check out the museum, even though it was raining, so th there's always something to do despite, despite the, the weather. And we really appreciate your time. You're a wealth of information. Great thank work. you so much. I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank historian Dan Lee and the Public Information Office at the City of Alexandria who, who helped set this up so that our viewers can see some of the historic sites in the Washington, D.C. area while we're all you know, still at home. It's hard to travel right now, so thank you again one more time. And with that said, Graham's going to show us the, the fort here for a little bit, and that's the, the end of the stream. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.